Van Dijk uh, chair there, and uh, her background includes both an MD and a JD degree, which impresses everyone. <laughs> and uh, um, also has argued cases in front of the Supreme Court, so uh, we're tremendously pleased to welcome Dr. Wax tonight, and I'll hand over to her now and for her talk. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me uh, here to Florida Southern and the Center for Pre Free Enterprise, and I'm not just here for the weather. Uh, I am here to talk to you about the perilous search for equal results. Uh, initially, I am going to begin my talk by describing to you some of the experiences that I've had at Penn Law School, my home school. And then I'm going to try to draw some broader lessons from that experience for the future of free expression in the academy and society as a whole. And I will explain the title of my talk. The title of my talk is related to this topic quite intimately. So stay tuned. So what was my recent experience at Penn Law? My strange saga began on August 9th of last year when I published an op-ed in my local newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, with Professor Larry Alexander of San Diego Law School. And that op-ed was entitled, Paying the Price for the Breakdown of the Country's Bourgeois Culture. The piece listed some of the ills currently afflicting American society and it suggested that the re-embrace of so-called bourgeois values, and here we were referring to a well-worn cultural script for mature adulthood that prevailed in the United States before the 1960s, might help relieve some of our problems. In what became perhaps the most controversial passage of the op-ed, we pointed out that not all cultures are equal. Some are more successful than others in preparing people to be productive citizens in modern technological societies. In an interview the next day, we confounded the controversy, or rather I did. It was an interview in the Daily Pennsylvania, our local school paper. In that interview, I defended the assertion that some cultures are better than others, functionally superior was the term I used, by pointing out how people vote with their feet. I noted how global migrants flock to white European countries and don't risk their lives in rickety boats to go to Venezuela or Zimbabwe. And as someone pointed out, since one of those at least is landlocked, that's not surprising. <laughs> Our piece and the selective statements quoted in the paper evoked an immediate firestorm from the media, the public, and from academia. Groups at Penn and elsewhere labeled me a racist, bigot, white supremacist, xenophobe, and hater, the familiar litany of accusatory terms, and we know them all. Some colleagues of mine immediately published a piece in the school paper criticizing our praise of the 1950s on the grounds that the shortcomings of that era, which in fact we acknowledged in our op-ed, rendered the entire period irredeemably evil. A flimsy argument, but at least it was an argument. Not long after, however, 33 of my colleagues signed a so-called open letter in the same school paper that condemned and, quote, categorically rejected, unquote, all my views. That letter contained no explanation, no reasons, no argument, no justification. It didn't even specify the views that were being condemned. After some online criticism of the letter, one month later, the main instigator of the letter, our local Torquemada, posted a rambling 15,000 word refutation of our little 800 word op-ed on a website called Heterodox Academy. And as far as I can tell, he argued in effect 
that bourgeois values are worthless and make no difference. In response, I asked him personally whether he would rather live in a neighborhood where most people adhere to those values or most do not. His response, I won't answer that. <laughs> So here's a law professor saying, I don't do hypotheticals. Having argued before the United States Supreme Court, I can assure you that our Chief Justice would not be amused. And despite his argument and his evasion, he never explained why it was necessary to gang up and publicly condemn me. Soon thereafter, Another colleague told me angrily that the hurt and damage inflicted on Penn Law by my op-ed had ruined his summer. Another said that the open letter was necessary to get my attention, so I wouldn't write anything like that anymore. There were a series of comments and responses that could only be described as hostile, not friendly to dissent, to say the least. Indeed, my colleagues used the language against me of an enemy, an enemy of the people, not a colleague. It was the language of contempt, to borrow from Arthur Brooks of the American Enterprise Institute, mocking, belittling, attempting to exclude and to humiliate. Don't engage was the message, simply dismiss. And last December, my own dean asked me to take a leave this year and to stop teaching a mandatory first year course, citing all the pressure that was on him to banish me. And his hope was that if I went away, the controversy would die down. Of course, I refused. When I reported our conversation in a Wall Street Journal piece I did last February, he publicly denied that he had asked me to leave for the reason stated Dear listener, I assure you he had. And then he sent me an irate email from his iPhone stating, you're a liar, Amy. Now these events show how key rules of the road for academic conduct and academic discourse, rules like engaging in civil debate, giving reason justifications, not calling names or using slurs, and being honest and forthright were routinely violated at my institution, as they increasingly are at other universities as well. And I can confidently identify that as a growing national trend. Of course it's all in a good cause, and we know what that cause is. Advancing the progressive agenda, advancing social justice. And notice here I am talking about academic discourse and not the First Amendment, because the First Amendment of our Constitution limits only public and not private institutions. That's an important distinction. The public-private line is there to limit the government's power to control our lives. What this means is that technically private institutions can censor all they want. And of course, University of Pennsylvania is private. So my argument here is a normative one. Not that they are legally barred from doing so, but that they should not. Rather, they should give the widest possible ambit to dissent, because that is essential to the educational mission, as well as the integrity of our democracy. Now, as I said, who is responsible? for this trend, this baleful trend, this hostility to dissenting opinion, to unorthodox opinion in the university? With few exceptions, the progressive left. Why is that? Well, lots of reasons. But the practical reason is that the left overwhelmingly dominates the academy today. Increasingly, power and politics therefore determine who gets to speak and what they get to say. In today's left-dominated climate, and I am being partisan here, I admit it, universities are no longer sites of free and fearless inquiry. 
They are sites of orthodoxy, mercilessly enforced. As Jonathan Haidt of Heterodox Academy put it in response to my colleague's open letter condemning me, quote, every open letter you sign to condemn a colleague for his or her words or views brings us closer to a world in which academic disagreements are resolved by social force and political power, not by argumentation and persuasion. Which brings me to the denouement of my story and, of course, the theme of this talk. Sometime after my op-ed was published, student activists at Penn Law, in looking for dirt on me, unearthed and then complained to my dean about a blogging heads podcast I made seven months previously at the invitation of a Brown University economist, Glenn Lowry, who also happens to be black. He has this online video discussion that he calls The Glenn Show on the Blogging Heads website. I made the point in that exchange that racism was an implausible explanation for some of the disparities observed between minorities and other law students, for example, in obtaining prestigious clerkships or in uh, obtaining partnerships at very prestigious firms. Rather, I opine, student performance, student grades, so-called supply-side factors, as economists call it, were a better explanation. He then turned the conversation to the topic of affirmative action. I then said, and these were the words objected to, that I could not recall any black students at Penn Law graduating at the very top of the class, and that from my own experience teaching for 20 plus years, I rarely remember any black students scoring in the top half of my own first year mandatory procedure class. And of course, in saying this, I was thinking back to uh, my 20 years of experience. I went on to speculate that affirmative action sometimes places minority students in settings where they are academically overmatched, and that this can prove an uphill battle for them. Once unearthed, my observations about student performance went viral, resulting in a social media blitz and a renewed campaign to remove me from teaching a mandatory first year class. This time, the dean acquiesced immediately. He announced his decision to the entire Penn Law community in a lengthy email message. I think it is instructive to contemplate what that message said and did not say. So I want to review some of his statements with you. First, he claimed that my assertions, which were somewhat mischaracterized, were false. But in a typical catch-22, in a typical gotcha, he offered no data to back up the claim. Indeed, he stated, our school does not collect grade information by race, raising the question, of course, of how he could be so sure I was wrong. He said I violated confidentiality policies, but cited none. Most tellingly, though, for my argument here, he speculated as follows. He said, black students in my class, quote, may reasonably wonder whether their professor has already come to conclusions about their presence, performance, and potential for success, and may legitimately question whether her belittling statements will adversely affect their learning environment. The key assertion here is that the statements I made might adversely affect their learning environment. Now, it is worth asking, what does this kind of bureaucratic palaver actually mean? What does the dean mean, and how can he gauge such effects? Can such effects be examined objectively? Do minority students in my class earn lower grades than in their other first year classes? Well, the claim that I actively penalize them is a non-starter, as the dean well knows first year classes are graded blind, and I don't get to see who gets what grade until after the grade is finalized. 
Maybe it means my presence in the classroom impedes learning, but then minority students should do palpably worse in my class than in other classes. Now, all of these possibilities can be objectively examined and numerically verified. So far, no effort has been made to investigate. And I predict no effort will be made. Because, I submit to you, facts are beside the point. The beauty of my dean's allegations, and this unfortunately is true for much of what passes for administrative discourse in universities today, the beauty of it, is that facts really do not matter. What matters are perceptions and feelings, and especially student perceptions and student feelings. In other words, the inmates are in charge of the asylum. Professors who hold unpopular positions or state inconvenient facts are regarded as psychologically toxic. If their presence causes offense or distress or fears of ill treatment, regardless of whether ill treatment is forthcoming, that is enough to eject them from the classroom. These perceptions and feelings are self-confirming. Thus, they are immune to challenge. They are purely subjective. It's all in the mind of the beholder, and the beholder's mind reigns supreme. So what is wrong with this? As Glenn Lowry said and pointed out in criticizing my dean's actions, allowing student discomfort to determine whether a teacher gets to teach is a weapon of mass destruction. It is an all-purpose device for penalizing professors who hold unorthodox views and challenge the received wisdom. And of course, the possible scenarios are endless. I won't list them. It will take too long. The professor supports Trump and his policy. She believes that colonialism was not an unalloyed evil, that women are less interested in science than men on average, that illegals should be deported. We can go on and on. Which brings me to the topic of the quest for equality of results, which I believe is a central quest in our society today and in the university that is grievously eroding academic values and indeed the very search for truth itself. I submit that the aggressive, dogmatic, progressive pursuit of equality defined as equality of outcomes and especially group outcomes has become an item of faith in the academy today. And that quest, which is central to the obsession with identity, diversity, and inclusion that now pervades the academy, has seeped out into society as a whole. It threatens the core of the academic enterprise, which is the disinterested search for truth. And it seeds and peoples multiple sectors in society that are culturally dominated by elites, the media, the workplace, the professions, big business, and the entertainment industry. And it distorts all of those enterprises by punishing those who point to and discuss inconvenient facts and ideas that do not comport with the reigning ideology. As David Azarad of the Heritage Society has observed, in the service of equal results, all right-thinking people are constrained to, quote, denounce the mistreatment of designated groups at the hands of an unjust society and to praise their accomplishments, whether real or fake, genuine or fabricated, and those who venture beyond the safe space do so at their peril. And of course, the accuracy of his words is reflected in the outsized, almost hysterical response to my statements and observations about bourgeois values, cultural difference, black student performances, and the like. In the university today, 
ideas about group differences, and observations about the possible sources of those differences must be suppressed and banned unless they fit a dominant narrative. And what is that narrative? Ours is an irredeemably racist or sexist society, and all group disparities flow from discrimination. Correct thinking on racial preferences, like affirmative action, is even more baroque and self-contradictory. As one of my students recently said, there is no logic to it. All virtuous people accept that affirmative action is good and necessary. Only evil people oppose affirmative action. But the academic gaps that make it necessary although sometimes glaringly obvious, may not be mentioned in polite company. Or they're illusory, or they're the product of racism, or they're amenable to instant correction through the offices of racial preferences and various programs and initiatives without end. Indeed, central to the practice of affirmative action in our society today, and it is pervasive, is a tenacious myth. I call it the central myth of affirmative action. Once beneficiaries arrive at their institution of higher learning, they instantly catch up. All group differences are erased. All, different, all groups become the same. Any suggestion that the myth is just that, that groups do differ, that performance gaps often persist, is reconfigured as some kind of attack an assertion of inferiority, a notion that professors somehow think less of some students than others. And of course, such disparagements cause hurt and offense and trauma, and they must be penalized. In the climate that prevails at the university and in many workplaces and in many businesses and in many other sectors of our society, this set of rhetorical moves amounts to a position that affirmative action and the progressive agenda generally can never be questioned or assessed. It is untouchable. And of course, these evasions are part of broader uh, patterns. Group differences, group differences in behavior, in performance, in workplace success, in rates of school discipline, in wealth, in health, in home ownership, in credit and lending. The list goes on and on. They exist. But they can never be attributed to anything vic victims do or choose. Certainly not to anything an individual can control. Never to behavior, choice, or performance. Examples are everywhere. In effect, in common parlance, the idea of victim responsibility is banished. That's called blaming the victim. As Heather McDonald at the Manhattan Institute has recently noted, patterns of school discipline, higher rates of discipline for minority boys, must not be attributed to actual gaps in rates of offending, even though there is very good evidence that such gaps actually exist. Rather, the favored explanations are systematic racism, structural discrimination, unfair treatment. Ditto for lending and home mortgages and all the other stuff on the list that I have just mentioned. Which brings us back to affirmative action and how we are allowed to talk about it. Like many good conservatives, I think that private institutions should be able to adopt whatever admission policy they want, including selling seats at the university, which seems to be more and more popular, <laughs> and let the chips, which has been going on for a long time, of course, and let the chips fall where they may. But the problem is that the chips are not allowed to fall. The hope for group equality that grows out of affirmative action, that hope does not stop at the schoolhouse door, far from it. It feeds into elaborate taboos, charades, and untruths that pervade society and affect what we can think, say, and notice and attempt to prove 
or disprove. And when the promised equal outcomes don't occur, resentment, disappointment, and recrimination ensue. And those of us who run institutions are not allowed to defend ourselves by pointing to other causes for unequal outcome, different choices, behaviors, talents, family structure, study habits, the list goes on. By requiring us to tell untruths on pain of social death, this regime of political correctness is humiliating and unfair. And it generates its own forms of resentment and mistrust. And of course, that tells in many of our political divides, the divides that we are dealing with today. Now, what are the implications of what I've said for those of us involved in education, in academic institutions, which includes all of you out here? Right now, we are dwelling in a climate of fear and intimidation. Students, faculty, alumni, and donors, in my experience, and also in the experience of many I have spoken to as I have gone around the country, do not feel free to dissent from approved opinions. And of course, that is how the progressives who control the academy would have it. They want it that way. Orthodoxy is especially potent among students who are in constant fear of being called out by their peers for that laundry list sexism, racism, xenophobia, bigotry, hate speech, and other violations. There are tremendous pressure not to utter the wrong opinions or to associate with anybody who does. And I know that because I have been disinvited from lots of things in the past year and a half. I recently was disinvited from an event at Princeton run by a club devoted to free speech, ironically <laughs> enough. I have been deplatformed by a organization, student organization at the University of Pennsylvania that says, quote, we are devoted to nonpartisan and balanced dialogue, unquote. No irony here. No sense of irony. In the atmosphere of political correctness prevailing on campus today, Mission statements like that are virtually meaningless. And of course, we know how students, administrators, and I'll get to them in a minute, and faculty control the discourse. They traffic in that parlance of the grievance culture, that gorilla of a heckler's veto, that rhetoric of feelings of upset, disrespect, hurt, offense, and psychological trauma, the need for a safe space the accusation that others are making their spaces unsafe by uttering opinions they may not agree with or they may not like. And they use all of this to silence unpopular ideas. And they know the ploy is powerful because it is irrefutable, it is unanswerable. But most of all, they know that the authorities of the university will back them up, will grovel, will apologize. I will tell them, don't worry. We'll keep it safe for you. It won't happen again. I am regularly struck, indeed, by the refusal of those in authority in the university to rebuke or remonstrate with students who interfere with others' freedom of expression. It's even worse than that. The university is replete with growing numbers of bureaucrats diversity bureaucrats at every university I know is hiring more and more, right? They are there to monitor attitudes, receive complaints, and guard sensitivities. They police vocabulary, identify dog whistles, and tell us what terms are forbidden crime things. And of course, there are so many rules. The rules proliferate by the day. Nostalgia for the 1950s is hate speech. Praising Western civilization is white supremacy. Making observations about what goes on in your own classroom is a forbidden insult. And finally, more importantly, victim groups, historic and self-defining, 
and growing in numbers deserve special solicitude. They have been given virtually absolute veto power over what can be said and even who will be allowed to teach. And the saddest thing about this is the effect it has on the students themselves. It undermines their ability to cope with untowards ideas. It discourages their resilience. It advertises their own psychological weakness. It is a pyrrhic victory. In this vein, I recall the story, and some of you may not be familiar with it, perhaps the older members of the audience will be, of MIT scientist Nancy Hopkins, who confessed that she almost fainted and had to leave the room when former president of Harvard, Larry Summers, suggested that men's and women's abilities might differ in ways relevant to their role as scientists, a proposition for which there is actually some objective evidence. As a woman, I cringe not at Summers' suggestion, but at that story. It feeds into every cliche about women's mental weakness, emotionality, and inability to deal calmly and objectively with challenging ideas, arguments that were used for centuries to keep women out of the academy and out of public life. And think about the women at Google who complained that the mere presence of James Damore, author of the infamous memo about gender differences in STEM fields crippled their very capacity to perform on the job. The knowledge that he was in an office down the hall kept them from functioning. I find myself asking, are such people fit to lead, exercise power, and take responsibility for a demanding and competitive society? I ask the same question about my law students. I conclude that they are not. Yet we continue to infantilize our students by giving in to their untutored demands. This is not education, it is capitulation. Now I want to end by asking what the present situation implies for the future of our educational institutions. Well, more and more our institutions have become politicized places, and they are places that take positions on public issues of the day, something that I actually think should be done virtually none of the time. Really, that is what I would suggest. At Penn, for example, the university has repeatedly opposed Trump, his immigration policies, his foreign policies, whatever you can think of. The president of our university, Amy Gutman, sends out regular email messages dumping on Trump. She is overtly partisan. What can we do about this? Well, I'll give some pie-in-the-sky suggestions. Very unlikely to be implemented anytime soon, but I'll just throw them out there. First, how I wish that the professoriate would remind students of the central missions of the university, the search for truth, but also the preservation of our traditions and the best that has been thought and done in the world. And all of this requires honest debate, which requires thorough investigation, intellectual honesty, lots of hard work, and above all, a thick skin. The marketplace of ideas is not for the faint of heart, and that is not a lesson that is common or popular in the academy today. The notion that offense and upset, that bruising thoughts and unpleasant facts just go with the territory, they are an intrinsic feature of an open society. And they are certainly central to the academic enterprise. And they cannot ever be avoided. Apropos, and in a more practical vein, we would all benefit from some basic rules of the road for conduct in the university. And this is not the same as free speech, because the rules I'm about to give you involve some rules forbidding certain kinds of speech. That's the irony here. 
I myself impose some simple guidelines for my elective classes, which are the only ones I'm allowed to teach, and they work surprisingly well. So what are these? First, no one can be heard to say, I am offended. You can be offended. Please be my guest and be offended. But you cannot say it to your fellow students. Second, no one may accuse anyone else inside the class or out, dead or alive, of being a racist, sexist, xenophobe, white supremacist, or any of those other derisive identity, derisive identity-based labels, slurs, and names. They do not enlighten, educate, or edify, and they add nothing of value. They simply intimidate. They bully, and they shut down the discussion. Third, no one can complain to administrators, those officious thought police, about anything said in the class. The question, of course, is whether there's any hope of these protocols being implemented. I am pessimistic. Finally, and I am writing about this currently, I think that both the government and private donors need to drastically rethink their lavish financial support for higher education, and especially for elite and selective institutions. Those institutions serve only a tiny portion of the population, and at this point, they are undermining the core precepts of education and preparation. I call this project Defund the Ivies. I remind people, and I've actually said this in print, only 10% of the population can be in the top 10%. That's just a basic rule of arithmetic. Only 20% of the population can be in the top 20%. What about the rest of us? I think that is one of the themes that lies below the surface of our current politics. The test of a good society is the role and the dignity for ordinary, unspecial, average people. I think that donors, philanthropists, the rich, should try to find better ways to improve ordinary people's lives. The people who have been unduly neglected, indeed worse than that, mocked and scorned by our elites. I have some suggestions. I recently visited a wonderful college outside of Philadelphia called the Williamson College of the Trades, which educates several hundred young men, and it is all male, every year in trade-based skills of all kinds. We should have one of those in every town, in every city. And our wealthy Silicon Valley types, our finance guys, that's where their money should be going. Other ideas as well. I want to close by quoting Andrew Sullivan a very popular blogger, in advocating for an older conception of equality, one that enshrines opportunity, personal responsibility, and doesn't expect equal results, because equal results and liberty cannot coexist. He says, quote, liberalism has never promised equality of outcomes, merely equality of rights. It's a procedural political philosophy rooted in means, not a substantive one justified by achieving certain ends. Well, in academia today, that liberalism is on life support. It's virtually extinct. And in its place is a utopian egalitarian fantasy that depends on denial and the banishment of those who dare to notice reality. And of course, maintaining any fantasy rests on force, not reason. It's antithetical to our way of life and should be resisted by all people of goodwill. So I invite you to join that resistance. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weiss. That's a very stimulating talk, which chimes in very well with our motif, which is very much that freedom of institutions, including free speech, free markets, pluralist politics, are actually beneficial, the most beneficial system that's ever been seen in operation for ordinary people. And the emphasis on ordinary people is really music to our ears. Dr. Watts has kindly um, agreed to answer questions, and um, we will come amongst you with our uh, microphone. You may find it on a bit, we'll take it away from you. But right now, this is going to get taken away from me, so uh, let's get going. Um, any questions, please? Ah, thank you. Where are we? Okay. Hi. Um, I did a little bit of research um, on some of the things that you said before you came today because there's a lot of discussion amongst my peers about some of your comments you've made in the past. And um, I looked at what the Daily Pennsylvanian, which you've talked about uh, in your speech today, said. And this is not about um, your comments about your students in the classroom. It was about um, your opinions on the Brett Kavanaugh hearing. And I'm hoping you can clarify some of the remarks that you made. And it quotes you as saying, but even if he did it, 17 years old, we are now saying that a man is going to pay for the rest of his life for military act of, you know, recklessness, which didn't create any permanent harm except through this manufactured idea that this is such a horrible, traumatic thing, Wax said, adding, his whole life is now ruined. Um, do those views that they quoted you as saying reflect your views, or um, were you misquoted there? I wasn't misquoted. So you, you do believe that? I certainly was not misquoted. Okay, and uh, I'm speaking as someone who is a Republican. Uh, do you think that that view represents the views of the Republican Party, or? Oh, certainly not. not. I wouldn't represent the views of the Republican Party because I think the Republican Party is represents a range of views. The Republican Party is very fragmented at this point, with people just running the gamut of, of opinion. love to see me fired, uh, but my fellow faculty members are ambivalent about that, even the most left, the most progressive, because of course they are protected by tenure too. They do not want to see the protections of tenure weakened or eroded, so this is very much you know, a matter of self-interest on their part. They have pulled their punches on this, but people outside the university are regularly calling for me to get fired. So you were silenced by being forced to go on a nationwide tour to explain So you were silenced by being forced to go on a nationwide tour to explain your views of I have not claimed that I was silenced. My claim is a very different one. I am making a claim, a normative claim, about how academic discourse should proceed and how colleagues and people within academic institutions should respond to those who disagree with them. Okay? The response I got was one of shunning, of hostility, of contempt, of expression of the opinion that I should be silenced in the sense that I should feel constrained not to say these things again. Okay? And the instrument brought to bear, the instruments brought to bear on me to affect that result were social and academic ostracism and my dean to the extent that he had control by actually silencing me in the sense of taking me out of a class where I will no longer be relating to students or teaching students uh, in a particular way. So this is sort of a quasi 
form of silencing. I, but really, I am making a very different and more nuanced point, which is a point about how academic institutions should function if they are going to be true to their mission. That is my, the bottom line on what I am trying to say. And I think there are corollaries to that. I don't want to go on too long. One is that people who are looking for psychological comfort and safe spaces and are not prepared to engage unpleasant issues on the merits perhaps do not belong in universities. You know, universities used to be considered very rarefied places, not places, not you know, democratically available institutions. And there was there was some wisdom to that because of the function that these that these places are supposed to serve. The search for truth is a hard, a heavy lift. Hello, um, I just had a quick question for you. So you defend your statements on the performance of black students by saying that because the university does not organize grades by race, they're unable to prove you wrong. Now, as the person making the positive statement, doesn't the burden of proof rest on you rather than simply saying, I'm right because you can't prove otherwise? This is not a court of law, okay? We have a dean who has removed me from the classroom based on these statements and then turned around and say that he has no proof because my statements were false and that he has no proof that those statements were false. Regardless of where the burden of proof rests, right, there is the open question of whether they're false. I can tell you I have 20 years worth of files. I could take them out. Uh, and I have great confidence that I could prove what I said. Not only that, I've had the weird experience of a number of members of my faculty and other faculties coming up to me and saying, well, I'm a first year professor and, and I have the same experience. Everybody knows that what you're saying is basically true. I, I mean, I'm not gonna you know, out those people, put them in jeopardy. Uh, you know, the ultimate question is, is it true or false? You know, but even if I'm wrong about it, so what? People make statements that are inaccurate. Should they be punished for those? I mean, academics make inaccurate statements every day of the week. I can, I can attest to that uh, because mistakes are made. Can I ask you one more question? That's up to the moderator. <laughs> if it's a quick one, but we have other people talk as well. Okay. Right. Uh, next question. Okay. Okay. Dr. Wax, I recently watched a, um, a video by one of your colleagues. Carrie, I can't think of the last his last name, but he's an expert on regulation. Call your name. That's it. And he makes the, he seems to make the argument that is based upon what I believe a faulty view of the Constitution as it relates to the operation of the federal government in that area of administrative, the administrative state. Could you comment on the role in your view of the unregulated, unelected administrative state uh -huh. on your topic? That is a very, very big subject. I, I think it's a little far afield of um, what I'm talking about here. 